But to me, the Bible is the infallible Word of God. And I believe that God has watched over His Word, that there's not one punctuation out of place. Greetings, friends, in the matchless name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to part one of our podcast series on Bible translations, specifically looking at how the King James Version is the only infallible, accurate translation of the Holy Bible. This will be a short video introduction, and then a longer audio podcast will follow. So the purpose of this series is to humbly show why I am a King James Version only preacher, and as you'll see, so is my brother Cameron Smith. He's a pastor in Napoleon, Ohio. And as some of you may know, in my 2020 debate with Rod Bergen, I stated the seven reasons I am a King James Version only pastor. And as this podcast series will show, Brother Cam has done a lot of research in this area, a lot of studies, so I'm very thankful for that. He knows a lot more about this topic than I do. So please contact me if you want to reach out and get in touch with Brother Cam with questions about Bible versions. So this is the first part of a few recordings on this topic of King James Version only. And we hope to have a few more by the grace of God, maybe in a week or a couple of weeks. We'll see how the Lord leads. Recall Revelation 22, 18 and 19. If any man adds to the Bible, plagues will be added unto him. And verse 19 is especially important for this topic. If any man takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. I just want to make a quick point. There's over 31,000 verses in the King James Version Bible, and every other translation takes lots of words away from the King James Version Bible, so they're in danger of having their part taken out of the Book of Life. It's a very serious thing. Here's a book Brother Cam gave me. It's called Look What's Missing. And the author of this book, David Daniels, he only sampled 257 verses. Now remember, there's over 31,000 in the King James Version. He sampled 257 only. And I want to show you this. I'll do a screenshot of this. Out of those 257, 95% of those 257 are negatively affected in the NIV. 91% of them are negatively affected in the ESV. And then 78% of them are affected in the Amplified Version. And those are just a few of the Bible versions. And remember, it's a curse to change just one word or take one word away from God's Word. And finally, I just want to make a few statements about Brother Branham. Our precious prophet was not explicitly a King James Version only preacher, as we'll show in future podcasts. Numerous quotes show this. But he has other quotes about not adding or taking away one word of God or not taking away one word of the Bible. And so Brother Branham's quotes lead me and Brother Cam and numerous other preachers to be King James Version only because of those quotes. I'll put a few of these quotes at the end of the podcast after Brother Cam and I get done with our first recording. Here's a few samples. Brother Branham said, A genuine faith of God will never add nothing to it. And of course, that also includes takeaway because he's quoting Revelation 22, 18 and 19. Brother Branham said, In 1960, I want to be found innocent of ever trying to add one thing to the word or take away. I want to believe it just exactly the way it is. Teach the people to tow right up to it. When Brother Ann went beyond the curtain of time, he said in Jezebel Religion 1961, I preached every word just exactly the way Paul did. Don't want to add one thing to it to take one thing away from it. Just what the Bible said. And then in Spoken Word Original Seed, Brother Bram said, There's not one punctuation out of place in God's infallible Bible, the Word of God. So I'll put some of these quotes at the end. Hope you enjoy this podcast here. It's part one of Bible Translations, Why We're King James Version Only. God bless you and welcome to the Defending the Message podcast. I'm your host, Pastor Jesse Smith. In today's podcast, we're going to start the next topic of looking at Bible versions. And we're going to prove by the grace of God that the only trustworthy Bible translation is the King James Version, the authorized version. Our listeners will know that I've talked about this off and on for the past few months. And we finally got a chance, my brother and I, to sit down and record the first part to this series, hopefully, by God's grace. 
So I know this topic will be a blessing to you. And again, I want to state, and most of my listeners will know, that I'm not trying to create a man-made doctrine here. I'm not trying to cause division here. We're just trying to show the truth of God's Word and promote the purity of the King James Version. This is going to all be spoken in brotherly kindness and love. It seems most people are just unaware of the facts on this subject, and we hope this will be a blessing to all those who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. So with that, I want to let my brother Cam introduce himself, and then we'll get into the topic here by the grace of God. All right. God bless you, brother. It's a blessing to to be speaking with you today about these things. Um, yeah, my name is Cameron Smith. Uh, I'm a pastor in Napoleon, Ohio uh, at a church, Living Waters. And uh, we've been pastoring for about uh, almost 16 years. And by God's help, we have uh, kind of followed that same line you have. Uh, we, we desire truth from the inward parts. And uh, it's our desire, brother, uh, that we might be able to uh, converse on these things and, and to be able to bring some clarification about Bible versions. Uh, it's a very important topic. Uh, I would say even in the message of the hour, even right now, uh, it, it is more important than it has ever been before. And hopefully very soon here, we'll be able to get to some of the points to prove that. So yeah, brother, that's uh, we appreciate your labor. We appreciate your love for the people. Uh, and, and your desire to forward them in Christ, and I, I believe that's our desire as well. Yeah, very thankful for this topic, and uh, as I've said before, I wouldn't have my current understanding without you, Brother Cam, as far as God leading you into these studies, and then I've been able to listen to your sermons online. It's been a tremendous eye-opener to me, so I'm thankful that the Lord led you into this. I mean, I've kind of known about this topic over the years. In my 2020 debate with Rod Bergen, I mentioned the seven reasons I'm King James Version only, and I've never changed that stance. But I appreciate how the Lord led you into this, because that's what it's all about. Like you said, it must be for this time and season um, that God's put this on your heart the last few years, uh, because the Word of God is being attacked like never before, and of course we're nearing the coming of the Lord. So I just want to thank you for that, brother, and uh, may the Lord Jesus Christ bless this here. Amen, brother. And I'm, and I'm so glad that you've stuck with that King James uh, only approach. It is the true approach. And even now, there's more evidence than ever before within the last 10 years that that is 100% factual. And if I could start this out, brother, maybe my testimony just a little bit. Um, we were raised in a Christian home, but yet at the uh, age of about 1920, uh, the late 90s there, we had come into a spot where we were actually, we gave our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we were in the Assemblies of God Church. And, you know, the first thing I asked, I said, well, what type of Bible should I get? I mean, I, I want to read the right uh, the right version, and I, w- I want to be able to understand it. And, you know, what they told me was they told me to actually use an NIV Bible. Uh, so I bought that. And, uh, you know, an early Christian, you're on fire, you're loving the Lord, you're, you're, you're rejoicing at all the things that he's uh, now drawn you to because the Spirit of God is moving on you that direction. So you, you instantly get that zeal and that thrill. And uh, so we got that Bible and boy, did we read it. We, we read and read and read and I got a big, big giant one, the, the one that's got all the, the notes in it and everything like that. And one night I was reading and, and this is the, the opening of my experience with Bible versions Um, I actually got to uh, a place in Matthew 18 where I was reading, and I actually, before this podcast, I got on uh, NIV online, and and I actually went to the same portion, and to my surprise, uh, it is the same today online as what it was before. So uh, let me read it directly from uh, the NIV online here uh, in Matthew 18.10. It says here, it says, see that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my father in heaven. That's verse 10. Then directly, the next verse uh, is verse 12. And it says, what do you think uh, if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And uh, as I read that as a young believer, I seen why in the world does it go straight from verse 10 to 12? Where's verse 11? And uh, I honestly, the first thought that come to my mind was there must be a misprint 
in this Bible. I bought a bad Bible. Somehow the factory messed it up. So I got another Bible and I, I took a look at it and I'm like, well, what is supposed to be there? And, and I grabbed a, a King James Bible. And uh, so I read the 11th verse uh, and it said, for the son of man is come to save that which was lost. And so I went back to the NIV and you know what? In 10 or 12, that part is not even in either one. So it's not that they threw it in a different verse and just got rid of 11. Uh, they actually got rid of the phrase for the son of man is come to save that which was lost. Uh, I don't know about you, brother Jesse, but that's a, uh, well, I think I know about you as far as this, but that is a very important verse and one we shouldn't cut out. Uh, so immediately I, I began to study it out. The internet was you know, fairly new at that point in time as far as uh, for me, but uh, I got online and I and I found out that they didn't put that in there because they said it was not part of the earliest and most reliable manuscripts. So that was one of my wake up points very early on as a Christian uh, to show me that there's something going on here a little bit deeper in me. So it's not that it was a misprint. Uh, it was actually something that was done intentionally. So there it was, uh, you know, and, and I love it. The scripture says that, you know, the, uh, the Lord will guide you to all truth. And right off the beginning of my experience in Christ, I found out that, you know, there it is. There is a discrepancy between this Bible and other Bibles. Hey, Amen. That's an excellent point about God's hand of mercy, God's sovereignty over your life. Of course, all of our lives, but you see in your life, God wanted to guide you into all truth and showed you right away how this Bible version was intentionally, and I like that word because it's the evil spirit, right? It's the Antichrist spirit behind this Bible version that's intentionally trying to take away words of God. Uh, and we know there's all kinds of warnings against taking away the word of God, Proverbs 35 and 6, uh, Revelation 22, 18 and 19, Galatians 1, 6 through 12. There's so many warnings that we must preserve the word of God and we must receive every word of God. So, Excellent story. I love that story. I never heard that before till you preached it on a recent sermon, and I was so so uh, surprised, but then so thankful God guided you into all truth. Amen, brother. Um, and if I could, if I could just bring a point up just very quickly here, because the twisting and resting of Scripture that Paul talked about, it is actually written about in the Old Testament. Uh, so even showing that even in the Hebrew text, they were already dealing with uh, scribes and so forth that were doing things with the word of God that they shouldn't have done. And for that, you, you go to Jeremiah 8, uh, it's going to be 5 through 9, but I'll just read uh, 8 and 9. It says, how do ye say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made ye it. The pen of the scribes is in vain. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Uh, lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord, and what word is in them? So, so if you look at that portion of Scripture, it said the pen of the scribes was in vain. <laughs> so they were actually altering, writing things that should not have been. Now, uh, very interestingly, you can you can see that at, at this point in time with Jeremiah, they're getting ready to go to Babylon. You know, from there they they actually wrote the the uh, Babylonian Talmud. So, and and of course, there are other writings that came forth. There, you know, some perceive that uh, uh, part of the Book of uh, Enoch actually came forth at that point in time. So, but there was already little sects rising up and and writing things to fit their own perspective about what they thought about God or what they felt that supposedly God was revealing to them. Wow, it's an amazing verse, brother. I've never seen that before. That was Jeremiah eight verse eight, right? Uh, yes. Praise God. So now you can see again how this is a problem. The Believers have had down through the ages, right? It started in the Garden of Eden with the serpent, yeah. and now I never saw that, but I never saw that. It was in Jeremiah as well. Yeah. So what we're what's impressed upon us is literally Satan from the very get go has trying to make the church disbelieve their weapon. Uh, Brother Branham worked with that. 
you know, uh, I believe it was the, was it in the greatest battle ever fought? Uh, but he, he basically brought out that Satan's great weapon is to get you to disbelieve your weapon, which is the word of God. See his attack? Watch! Listen close, this closing. His attack is what? Disbelieve God's word. That's his attack. Now, can you see the greatest battles ever fought? There's only two forces. Satan and God. And what Satan's weapon against you is to try to get you to disbelieve your weapon. He disarms you. Let's, let's listen real quiet now. Listen. If he can get you to disbelieve your weapon is equivalent. If he gets you to believe that your weapon is not strong enough, he's disarmed you. Oh, Brother Neville, I hope we never believe that. Look. He's disarmed you when he gets you to disbelieve that weapon. Amen. When you lay that down, that finishes your fight. You're done. Hold that weapon. Don't you lay it down. We seize unbelief. So, uh, if you have a perfect word, you can have perfect faith. So, you know, that's our aim and intention because we also know that that is required for rapturing faith. Rapturing faith requires perfect word. Uh, so... The next thing that comes to our mind as far as uh, there I was, I was coming out of uh, Assembly of God, and, and honestly, um, I just kept reading the NIV Bible. Uh, I asked others about it, and they said, well, they're basically the same. But, but you know, it's, it's very easy for uh, sheep, especially young sheep, just to follow the older sheep uh, because, you know, there's a confidence in you when you see a Christian life. And you think that what they're doing is right. So almost right off the beginning of my testimony, uh, I found out that I was beginning to follow the majority. I was following those who I felt I could trust, uh, especially regarding uh, Bible versions. So until, literally until I came to the spot where God revealed this message to me uh, in 2002, um, I was following the NIV Bible, but you know what? I was taking a, a basic, uh, nominal Christian approach and, and it actually took the crying out for truth. Um, and then when God brought the message to me, um, that was the opening of the door where all of a sudden this really became a critical thing. Uh, I, I come to the message, and I found there that the King James Bible, um, it was the Bible everyone was using. Um, actually, I, at that point in time, I never heard of any other message believer using any other Bible. But then, uh, perhaps right around 2008, 2010, uh, I began to hear that preachers in the message or individuals in the message uh, were actually using other Bibles. And... Uh, that to me was a little bit alarming and, and it kind of reversed in my mind. Wait a minute. When I first come into this, I was actually brought right to that spot that they were taking things out of the Bible. And now I'm seeing that people in the message are beginning to do the same thing. So uh, it was something that it really altered my, my thinking about what was right and what was wrong and what was going on. Um, so basically What's happened over the last 10, 12, 14 years is as I began to devote myself to start understanding uh, the actual argument. And uh, you'll actually find within that argument that there are actually two families of manuscripts that are followed. And that is where and why we have all these different versions. So. The King James, uh, the authorized King James, because many have actually tried to modernize it and they, they try to do it with the modern text. But uh, actually, you'll find that it was in 1881 that Westcott and Hort were actually involved with wanting to get away from what they would term the villainous King James version. And what their desire was, was to come up with an entirely different Bible that would be written from a different source. Um, so from there, they actually had what they would call the Alexandrian family, uh, which is differed from the actual Byzantine family, which the King James Version was written from. Uh, so just very quickly for this idea. So literally, 
the King James Bible is the only Bible that is exclusively written from the Byzantine manuscripts, which is actually 90% of the textual evidence. The Alexandrian family, and this will be a surprise for those who are uneducated on, on the topic, which is okay because most people don't even look into this. Uh, and that's okay. I didn't either until it was forced upon me by the Holy Spirit. But uh, anyway... All the new versions, every single one of them, including the New King James, um, they are either altered or written exclusively from the Codex Vaticanus or uh, the Bible that the Vatican had. Uh, and, of course, uh, that's they say 93% written that way or 90% the, the new versions are written from the exclusively from the Codex Vaticanus. So and, and what they make up the rest of is they say 7% of it is actually from Codex Sinaiticus. And then the other 3% is from the Alexandrian scrolls. So that is very important. Now, uh, so what had happened then is so all these new versions are actually written from the Codex Vaticanus, uh, which is the Vatican. So uh, we can go into this later, but uh, uh, for you and I that are Protestants, uh, that should have an alarm, just a, a bell that's ringing uh, incessantly and in, uh, increasingly in our minds that, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, these, uh, this Catholic Church, and you know we, we respect and love people in there, but this system has actually killed, according to their own martyrology, uh, 68 million Protestants. So, so that, that brings an alarm up, okay, what's going on here? And why are all the new Bibles written from uh, a church that once did nothing but try to burn Bibles? So uh, that brings it to our mind uh, that this is actually an important subject. So anyway, uh, continuing with this thought of the message, I began to hear that preachers were using different Bibles. And uh, recently I, I, I was alarmed. I, I was looking at a tract from a, a, a different uh, message church. And it just actually stopped me right in my tracks as I was reading. I was just shocked. In their track that they witnessed to others, uh, they had a, a one-sentence statement at towards the end of the tract. And it said, the King James Bible is the most accurate Bible translation. When I read that, I was shocked, blown away. Because they were actually saying that the King James Bible was the most accurate. They didn't say it was the only accurate. They didn't say it was the infallible Bible translation. Uh, but they actually stated that it was the most accurate. That is alarming because if you don't have a perfect Bible, you can't trust it. <laughs> so, uh, Brother Jesse, you and I... Uh, I believe we are in complete unity over this thought, but uh, the King James Bible is actually the only infallible translation. So, you know, with that, you know, what I found out was that people in the message or, or brothers and sisters in this message uh, were now beginning to disbelieve the Bible that God gave us. And uh, that must needs that someone would take a stand. So we appreciate what you're doing, brother. Um, and it is our desire, too. We uh, Recently, we've preached four sermons uh, uh, working with this. And you could just trail on forever. The, the, the information on the King James Bible and the Bible version debate is very interesting. It's, it's phenomenal. Uh, you can actually get addicted to it, as we see some people will. So um, that, that's a good start, brother, for where we're going there. Excellent information, brother. Yeah, like you said, there is so much information available on this. Um, that's a great introduction to this topic, my brother. One point I think you brought out that truly helped me. It's, it's as if I'd heard it before, but it wasn't until after I heard you teach and preach on it until it really became solid in my mind was this major point that all Bibles come from either one of two sources. And so the King James Version is the only Bible that comes out of the Byzantine source of scrolls. Is that correct, brother? Yeah, that, that is absolutely correct. And, you know, if we would look into the purpose of why we were actually doing this, that would be the whole of it, because there must be some type of mentality that someone had 
a long time ago to undermine people's confidence in the word of God. The fact is, as I was told that all the Bibles are pretty much the same, they are actually uh, very much different. So literally, here's a quotation. So we would look at what was called the Byzantine family uh, that the King James was written from, and then you would have the Westcott Hort text. And here's a quotation. It said, I said, the New Testament was published in England on May 17th, 1881, and three days later in the United States after 11 years of labor. This is working with the Westcott Hort text that they had come up with. It says over 30,000 changes were made, of which more than 5,000 represent differences in the Greek text from that used as the basis of the King James Version. So right there, if you make 30,000 changes in the Bible, how can you not come up with different doctrine? How can you not come up with obvious errors or mistakes? Uh, you know, as I told you, as, as I was coming into Christianity, taking that portion of Scripture out, Matthew 18, 11, is very huge in the point of what Jesus Christ was trying to accomplish. So that right there is one of those 5,000 changes in the Greek text. So, you know, not only do you have different individuals interpreting the Greek, but you also have a different Greek text in itself, which is very frightening because uh, the Bible tells us in Psalms, let me get to this scripture here. The Bible tells us in Psalms, uh, I believe it's 12, verse 6. It says, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of fire, purified seven times. So you and I, when we look at a Bible, wow, this word is, it's like silver that was tried in a furnace. It's purified. It's got to be right, 100%. Verse 12, 7, it says, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So the psalmist tells us right there that God, from even the point of him writing songs, because uh, a psalm is a song, that he was literally going to preserve every inspired word from that generation forever. <laughs> so uh, it, it's a beautiful thought, brother. That's an amazing verse, brother. And, uh, and then... Combining that verse with the history you've just shared is life-changing, you know, especially for someone who wants to read the only true Bible. Think of that. Our brother Cam stated it, 5,000 changes. Those are 5,000 little bits of truth that Satan took away from people. Uh, that's not just one. Like, it was one word in the Garden of Eden, right? Thou shalt not surely die. Well, now here in 1881 through Westcott and Hort, Satan has taken over 5,000 little bits of truth away from the Word of God. So going back to that point Brother Cam brought, it was so fresh to me, so true. You know, this topic is easily settled by just taking each Bible version and say, which source did it come from, right? So it's so easy. that This is the simplest way, I think, to kind of uh, filter it down. Any other Bible version outside of those using the source scrolls of the King James Version, which would have been the Byzantine scrolls, will be a false version because they have false scrolls, and then they constantly take away words from the scrolls that are in the King James Version scrolls. Yes, sir. So let, let me add something, Brother Jesse. So what you'll find is they would say, well, the King James language is archaic, so you can't understand it. So what would they come up with? they would actually come up with a new King James Version. And what that was supposedly to do was to update the language of the King James Version. Uh, so that's part of the issue here is because what they tell you is um, they're modernizing the language so people can understand it. They're, they're modernizing it so, okay, now we can apply this. It makes sense because... Uh, the King James is archaic. It's it's using words that we don't understand anymore and, and so forth. 
But when you actually start looking into the New King James Version, uh, you will find that the changes that they made were actually based on the Westcott Hort text. They did not try to update the language. They actually began to change and start hybriding the King James Version with ideas from a Westcott Hort text. Um, So that's another thing that is very problematic because uh, a lot of the preachers in the message, you know, were told that uh, the Amplified Bible was just actually a modernization of the King James Bible. Uh, It was meant to give clarification and understanding uh, to the Greek, so that the Greeks, these Greek scholars can help us is what they were told. So it'll help us understand what what the real content of the Bible is. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, these these message preachers, and hopefully, maybe they'll hear this. Maybe maybe they'll take a deeper look into it and uh, see what the actual agenda is. We have, uh, of course, uh, we'll have another video uh, working with the actual changes because uh, what's always said, the proof is in the pudding. So if I line up a King James Bible and an Amplified Bible, um, if it's just a, a language um, upgrade or, or, or some sort of understanding that's supposed to help us, it should line up very closely with the King James Version, like almost exact. But we'll find that that's not true at all. And actually, the interpreters of this Amplified Bible, uh, they began to start putting their own doctrines in there. They, they started putting their, their own thoughts into there. And you can't even teach message doctrine fully through it. The scriptures that they change will actually contradict other scriptures that prove that serpent seeds right, uh, that that prove that the Godhead is right, and, and so on. So we are actually sheep. And the wool is getting pulled over our eyes, even in this message, that all these Bibles are the same. And there it is. The Amplified Bible, for example, is written completely from the Westcott Hort text. It's not written from the King James at all. Um, if you actually look into the history of it, it was, it was actually a Presbyterian pastor's wife that took the Westcott Hort took the Hebrew, and she interpreted her own Bible for the people. Uh, She didn't finish it, but uh, a committee took it on, and they finished her work, and therefore we have the Amplified Bible, which has been updated uh, at least twice, the most recent time in 2015. So there's a lot there, and uh, you know, as you can see, there's so much information here, but really what we would need to do at some point in time is, is to actually look at the evidence especially from a message perspective, which is what we're looking at, and see if this affects what a God-sent seventh angel, William Branham, gave us. Yeah, excellent points there. And I didn't know about the Amplified Bible uh, coming from the Westcott and Hort text. So that would be an excellent point to use. Like, let's say you're listening to this as a, uh, a viewer, you know, on YouTube or something, or a podcast listener, and you're concerned about it, you know, out of the love of God in your heart for the love of the truth, right? The love of the true word of God, the King James Version. That might be a good point to take to a pastor or something like that. And of course, always go in love, uh, approach with just a, a desire for truth. And brother, you know, did you know this? And you just want to bring that point, like even the Amplified Bible is taken from the wrong source scrolls. Yes. So that would bring us to the idea that... Okay, well, what is the purpose of all of this? This is my personal opinion. There is some cover-up behind it, but we do see interaction. But I would say that the very purpose of the writing of a new text written from the Greek, which even the writers and even some on the committee were Catholics or Jesuits, um, it was actually a move of the counter-reformation and the reason it was done was because if you could pull people to a confusion in the word then you could make their experience with christ lax you could make it dumbed down uh, so that one they no longer had a full source of truth and because they didn't have that full ability to have truth, uh, you would be able to make them lukewarm. 
which is the characteristic of the seventh church age. It's a lukewarm church age. Now, it is very obvious from 1881 that when the Protestants took this hook, line, and sinker and began to move away from the King James Bible, that we are living in one of the most perverted, uh, lukewarm ages of all time right now. And now we're seeing it creeping into the message uh, at, at a very rapid pace. And uh, what is the purpose? Well, according to our Bible, Rome was that fourth beast in the book of Daniel. Uh, Rome, of course, everything shows that she was to be the last beast. For 2,000 years, she's been ruling to some extent. And it will end up with her leading a new world order. So that's why a lot of these changes are made in the Bible, because you actually have to change the content or, or lessen uh, the detail of the content in order for it not just to make Christianity more lax in its understanding, but, but it'll actually join it with other religions. So that's why you'll find that uh, the deity of Jesus Christ, many are alarmed, even Trinitarians are very alarmed because um, they'll take Jesus out and say he. They'll take the Godhead and they'll begin to, to loosen it out. So, so now all of a sudden, uh, the deity is not so clear. So if, if you just leave a couple scriptures, you, you'll alter the entire context or uh, the understanding of the Bible, which is why you hear a lot of people that are even from a standpoint uh, looking at Christianity based with other religions, including Islam, uh, uh, Judaism, and, and they will be saying, well, we're pretty much all the same. <laughs> no, we're not. Uh, there's some tremendous differences, but, but the overall perspective they're trying to proclaim is to join Protestantism back with Catholicism and then join it into an all new world religion. And uh, they are closer to that than ever before. Yeah, I'm just going to say this humbly. This is a very fascinating approach. Uh, Brother Cam, God has brought you through and the approach of seeing how this is all working into the one world religion. Uh, I recently made a video about that. Even at the Republican National Convention, they had a an elected official from California open up the convention with a prayer to the Hindu God. And in the background on the screens, they had the cross of Jesus. They had the star of David. And it was basically calling one of these Hindu gods the one true God, but trying to unite it with you know, Judaism, Christianity, uh, the Muslim faith, and so forth. So that's that's an excellent point you're making. And the devil's in this for the long game, right? He started this in 1881, of course, before that, but that's when the Westcott Hort text came out. And just decade after decade, he slowly introduces these false translations into churches, and it makes them lukewarm because they don't have a zeal for the Word of God. And I love that point you brought out about 1881. Uh, that was right at the end of the man anointing, right? There's four anointings. Yeah. There's a lion, ox, man, eagle. So right at the end of the Philadelphian church age, when the man age anointing is going to switch over to the eagle anointing, you know, Satan brings in this false group of scrolls through Westcott and Hort. And then here at the beginning of the Laodicean church age, it's a lukewarm age. And what better way to make people lukewarm than to start changing the word of God and uh, taking away words, adding words, adding like the Amplified, it adds the Trinity into the Bible, the word Trinity into the Bible that Brother Bram always pointed out. The word Trinity is not even in the Bible, but now message people are reading an Amplified Bible with the word Trinity now in the Bible. That's how Satan has slowly deceived people. So it's very important to see that uh, in the timing of it. I love how you brought in the timing of it. Even it goes back to Daniel's vision, you know, with I'm sorry, with Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, you know, the iron and the clay, the Catholic and Protestant in the feet of the image. And this is their way to do it. It's one way to do it, to get them into one world religion. Say, oh, all the Bibles are basically the same. All religions are basically the same. And it's the way to make people lukewarm. They're not on fire for the true word of God. They've got their own false Bible translations that no longer take a stand on certain important major doctrines. And remember, even taking one word away from his word would be a sin. But now they've changed over 5,000 things about the Greek text and, of course, many, many more Bible verses. Yeah, let me add a little bit more support to this. So it was always Catholicism's desire to take 
the word of God out of the people's hands. That's why in 400 AD, right, right around 400 AD, they actually uh, paid Jerome to actually write a Latin Vulgate, and uh, they put it in Latin, which was a dead language that no one uh, could understand. And that was just for the Catholic hierarchy, the intelligent people, that they could read it alone and no one else could understand it. So the common people, they removed the word of God from the common people. And think about it, that was not even changed until you get to the 1400s and the 1500s when uh, early Protestants began interpreting it. And it was actually the Catholic priests that actually, uh, you know, think about Martin Luther coming out of Catholicism, nailing 95 theses and coming against that. Uh, so we have that perspective. But here's another idea. The actual history of Catholicism, you know, we know this from Brother Branham and as far as teaching us that in Revelations 13, where it talked about how one of the heads of that beast out of the uh, sea, which was Catholicism, would be killed to death. Uh, so you have a pagan Rome. And then in 325, when Constantine rolled on, they had a papal Rome. So historically, You'll find this in history because there are not many manuscripts at all from the early centuries. And I mentioned this a little bit ago, and I'll mention it again because this is a great point. But uh, you will find that pagan Rome did nothing but try to destroy and stop Christianity. Historically, we find even with Diocletian, Diocletian, according to the church ages, he had 10 years where he absolutely tried to kill every Christian he could possibly kill. Not only that, but historically, um, he burnt every Bible he could find. Wow. Whether right or wrong, as far as uh, maybe it could have been a twisted one, uh, he burned it, uh, destroyed it, destroyed all the evidence. Well, you would think that would change after Constantine because, okay, now they're Christian. Well, you'll find what they did. Of course, they put it in Latin. But then they also burnt every scroll we can find historically. Um, I actually preached a sermon on it. It goes all the way up to uh, their own councils where they say that their people are forbidden to have a Bible. They're forbidden to read the Bible. And if they get caught reading one, they will have to recant. If they don't want to recant, they'll die with their Bible. They'll get burnt. So their quotations are still in their Vatican councils that they had, Council of, of of Trent and so forth. Um, but Americans and Christians don't even realize how soon that these things happened. Uh, if I remember correctly, we'll try to get this resource, brother. But it was right around the mid middle 1800s uh, that the Catholics were still uh, having Bible burnings in America. I believe it was in Massachusetts is where they had it. Uh, I think if I remember right, it was 1847. But they were still burning Bibles publicly, not not secretly, publicly showing their distaste for the word of God. Well, no wonder Catholicism has so many creeds and dogmas that don't line up with the Bible. They're completely against the Bible, but claiming that they are the true representative of Christianity. So more clearly than ever before, uh, this is a, a tremendously important topic and it is to keep a protestant a protestant so we can't go into the image of the beast we can't go into this system of the joining with catholicism and that is why all of a sudden they went from burning the bible to saying okay we have a new text for everyone to have so it, it is very beautiful what the spirit of god has revealed to his children in this age Amen, brother. Amen. That's powerful. I didn't even know they were burning Bibles, brother, in the 1800s. That's unbelievable. Yeah. And frankly, why don't they have to burn them anymore? Because they changed the text. <laughs> <laughs> they get the same results by changing the versions. On most Bible committees, uh, and this is what I've what I've I've listened to other speakers say. Um, there's generally a Jesuit on each council. Some of these Bible societies have been bought by Catholicism, by the Catholic Church. They've actually bought it. So they are controlling the spreading of the new versions. So uh, very alarming. Excellent point there, brother. If Satan 
realized he couldn't get Bibles out of people's hands. You know, Satan realized after all these years, well, they'll always want a Bible. He knew the next best thing is to change their Bible or pervert their Bible. Yes. Yeah. Now, Manley Hall, uh, I'd love to read this quotation. He, he wrote about the New World Order. And, uh, and this is 1944. Uh, he's a 33rd degree Mason. But uh, he writes this quotation. This, this is phenomenal. He said, to make things right, we will have to undo much of the cherished error. The problem of revising the Bible shows how difficult it is to do this. For the last hundred years, from 1944, uh, we've been trying to get out an edition of the Bible that is reasonably correct, but nobody wants it. What's wanted is the good old King James Version, every jot and tittle of it, because most people are convinced that God dictated the Bible to King James in English. So Manley Hall admits of his knowledge that from 1844, they were deliberately trying to destroy the influence of the King James Bible. So sometimes they hide the evidence right out in the open. But since most people are, you know, but they may, might not be wanting to read, they might be illiterate, uh, you know, they can just say these things openly and, and no one checks them. No, no one's looking. And uh, here it is. They've been telling us their whole plan the whole time. And there's many like statements, brother, that they, they say this. So part of the move from Loyola, um, you know, they were, they were saying that they had to destroy the serpent called the Bible. So there's a quotation from uh, the Jesuits in history from 1997 and it states it says uh, and this is from uh, i believe this is from yolola uh, loyola excuse me uh and it says then the bible that serpent which with head erect and eyes flashing threatens us with its venom while it trails along the ground shall be changed into a rod as soon as we are able to seize it for three centuries past, this cruel asp has left us no repose. You well know with what folds it entwines us and with what fangs it gnaws us. So even Catholicism, some of their head guys, admittingly were telling of the damage that the Bible did to its control over the world. So you can see that a counter-reformation they said they wanted to seize it. They said they wanted to change it from from a snake to a rod, which we understand that the Bible is no snake. The Bible is the in, infallible word of God. But to a mindset as that, that shows right now that they are absolutely anti-Christ as re their regards to the written infallible word of God. Yeah, Brother Kim, that's a powerful point. The Catholic Church recognized the power of the King James Version and one of my points that I use to say why I'm a King James Version only preacher is that mighty men of God use the King James Version, such as Charles Spurgeon, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, and of course William Branham, a prophet of God, and other men that were yielded to the Holy Spirit and able to bring forth the pure word of God from the King James Version. And no wonder these Catholic leaders were so afraid of the King James Version because it would produce a genuine Christian experience. It produced the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Right. So historically, every modern revival came from the King James Version. Uh, Jonathan Edwards had a powerful revival. John Wesley, a church age messenger, had a incredibly powerful revival george whitfield a uh, powerful revival um move on you have william seymour you have eric roberts of the welsh revival you have early on oral roberts um, from what i've seen uh billy graham uh and and brother branham all these individuals um uh, you know, the people, they clung to that King James Version. And uh, we see that it literally has caused every single major revival. 
I would say this, our prophet told us that we'll have a bride's revival. How are we going to get a revival if we move away from the King James Bible when it and it alone is the only infallible source to produce the manifestation of the power of God on the children of God? Amen. And brother, that brings to mind the quotes from Brother Branham. You know, how are we going to have a revival if you change even one word, just like the serpent changed one word? And I'll take it even further. Even if you change one or two doctrines, how can you have the true bride revival? And so that's an amazing point you brought out about all these men, even William Seymour. Brother Branham said the Zusa Street revival was the greatest revival since the day of Pentecost. Brother Branham said that. That's just the same kind of a thing that happened to our Pentecostal fathers over 40 years ago. God called out a man in California, one crossed out, give him the experience of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. From there formed Azusa Street, the old Azusa Street mission. From there scattered to the sweat the whole nation. From nation went to nation after nation until Pentecostal revival was burning everywhere. Hallelujah. What a blessing God had provided by grace. I don't care when it was. There's never been a revival like the Pentecostal revival. Right? Wesley never had it. None of them had it. Spurgeon, Calvin, Knox, great reformers, but they never had the revival like the Pentecostal revival. The greatest thing that struck the earth since the Holy Ghost fell on the day of Pentecost. So that's an amazing point that you made there by the grace of God that we got to have the pure word of God. The pure word of God will produce the revival. Yeah. Uh, God's word cannot fail. It absolutely cannot, will not, never will let us down. <laughs> you know, the Bible said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Uh, and, and that is factual. And this message, which was what? It was the gathering of all the revelations that were true. Brother Bram didn't come up everything new, but he, he, he picked up all the loose ends. Um, you know, you know, John Wesley had some things. William Seymour had some things. He put all these things together um, and brought forth exactly from the King James Bible the truth that we were to receive in this hour. Such a beautiful point there. Yeah, Brother Branham was called to finish the mystery of God. Uh, Revelation ten seven, restore all things. Uh, Matthew seventeen eleven, turn the hearts of the children back to the Pentecostal fathers. Revelation. Malachi 4, 5, and 6, and so this was part of it. Yeah, Brother Bram brought some new things, as we've said, but not a whole lot. Uh, we know the revelation of the seven seals was new. Uh, there's other new things he brought out, but a lot of it was restoration, restoring what had already been given by God at the beginning of the church ages through St. Paul and St. John and St. Peter, St. James, all the writers of the New Testament. And Brother Bram's uh, main ministry was to restore all things, restore our hearts back to the apostolic fathers. And of course, for that to happen, we need the pure word of God, the King James Version to do that. Yeah. So so literally what, what you see is, um, you know, God would raise a prophet up to bring the word. But you know who is the great compiler of that? Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ came out, he brought the revelation that put it all together. He showed the fulfilling. He showed... Uh, what the doctrine was. That's why you can see Jesus talks about serpent seed. Uh, Jesus talks about all these things. And and then you watch that as time, so God's move is always, he allows Satan to, of course, get in there with organizational spirits. Uh, it's, it's what it's always been, unfortunately. It, it, it's happened in the message even nowadays. But organizational spirits come in and they dull the people from the truth and makes them go to other heirs. Well, what God was doing you know, therefore, you know, just like Jesus, they were twisting the word and laws and and uh, uh, traditions that weren't even in, in the Bible. God's inspired word never said it. Uh, but yet 
Jesus Christ could come out and then the apostles following and, and, and Paul concluding as a first church age messenger and bring out the totality of what is truth. Then, of course, over seven church ages, it would be lost again, but then brought in our day right now, you know, Brother Branham, he would actually compile once again what was right amongst all the errors that were sowed in by the devil through organizational principles and, and the human mind. So he would bring us to that and we would have to say, okay, what is it? Uh, you know, that's why, that's why when you look at the message, there's so many different doctrines now. Well, what's right? So m most people will run from a quote, but they never take it into the word of God. If you take it back to the word of God, you will find that it is a simple moving source that shows what the prophet told us that was right. Brother Branham was like a man. He was just like me and you. We don't need to canonize the, the 1,200 sermons of the message. He was a man. <laughs> just like we can't canonize our own sermons. Uh, no one can canonize their own words because there was only one that spoke in perfection. His name was the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Savior, our God. And uh, there will be no other foundation. But that's what the prophet did uh, is he established with the King James Bible what was right. Yeah, you made some excellent points there, brother. Uh, one point I want to emphasize is that Brother Branham said every generation has a chance at the Word of God. And, yeah. we, and we saw that in the book of Judges, right, where another generation rose up that didn't know the Lord. And so in each generation, they have to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And uh, you brought out a great point. You know, God will allow Satan to inject these false Bibles into society because God has to give people what they want, right? Uh, Romans 1, 28, God gave them over to a reprobate mind uh, because they did not want to retain God in their minds. So people that don't want to retain the pure doctrine or the true word of God, the pure refined words of God, God sees that in their hearts just like Balaam. And so because Balaam didn't want to do the perfect will of God, God gives him the permissive will of God. So we're seeing that's why God has allowed all this time to go forth because he's got to give them what they want. And every seed will bring forth of its own kind. Thank God we have the seed of God in our souls. The Bible said we're born again of the incorruptible word, uh, the incorruptible seed, the word of God. So that's what we want. Since we're born again of God's seed, that's what we want, just God's word. And that word is only found in the King James Version version Bible. Amen. Very well said, brother. And a genuine faith of God will believe in God, and God is the Word. It'll never add nothing to it. The Bible tells us if we add one word or take one word away, our part will be taken from the book of life. Revelation 22, 18, the last closing chapter. I stand before him, I want to be found innocent. I've ever tried to add one thing to that word or take one way, well, it's just exactly the way it is. Teaching people to tore right up to it. If the Bible says this, I can't help what anyone else says, I got to stay right with that. And here was those people standing around like that when I said, Will Paul have to be judged for the gospel he preached? Said, Yes. I said, I've preached every word just exactly the way he did. And the millions screamed out, we are resting on that. That's where I want it to be on the cross. I want it to be that way, just like that. Just what Paul said. I don't want to add one thing to it, take one thing away from it. Just what the Bible said, that's just where I want to keep it going. See? And of course you keep it like that. You've got to have somewhere that faith can take its resting place. And to me, I don't know how you feel about it, but to me, the Bible Amen. is the infallible Word of God. Amen. And I believe that God has watched over His Word, that there's not one punctuation out of place. And so we want to thank our listeners. Thank you for your downloads. Thank you for uh, sharing these podcasts and videos. So we look forward to our next podcast, friends. God bless you, and may Jesus Christ anoint you to defend the message. Good afternoon.